Excited Utterance, the Evidence and Proof Podcast. Episode number 42, Rick Simmons, Evaluating Credibility Using Prior Convictions. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Ed Chang, from Vanderbilt Law School. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting-edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. Our goal is to bring a virtual workshop to you every week throughout the academic year. This week, our guest is Rick Simmons. Rick is the Moyer Professor for the Administration of Justice and Rule of Law at Ohio State's Moritz College of Law. Rick teaches evidence, criminal law and procedure, and computer crime and surveillance. His research focuses primarily on the intersection of the Fourth Amendment and new technology. Our podcast today features Rick's new article, Evaluating Credibility Using Prior Convictions, an empirical study of Rule 609 and suggestions for practical reform, which is forthcoming in the Boston College Law Review. In it, Rick presents two new empirical looks at the workings of Rule 609, in particular the part of 609 that enables testifying defendants to be impeached with their prior convictions. The first study is a survey asking law students and judges to rate the probative value and unfair prejudice of various potential past convictions. The second is a case law study that tries to ascertain what convictions tend to be admitted and what tend to be excluded in federal district court. Rick reports on the results of his studies and their implications, and then offers a proposal for reforming Rule 609 based on the findings. Rick, delighted to have you on Excited Utterance. Welcome. Very excited to be here. Thank you. Over the last year and a half, we've probably had more episodes related to Rule 609 than any other. But to start us off, can you take a few minutes and remind us what Rule 609 is and why it's been subject to so much criticism? Sure. Rule 609 is the rule of evidence that essentially guides whether or not you can bring in a prior conviction to impeach a witness. It sets out a series of balancing tests that will guide judges as far as when they can admit these convictions and when they can't. And it's most controversial when it applies to criminal defendants. So again, the judge is supposed to apply a balancing test, a probative value for impeaching a witness, and weigh that against the unfair prejudice of the jury hearing about a prior conviction. The balancing test is different depending on whether or not the witness is a criminal defendant, whether or not the prior conviction is within 10 years, and so on. So it sets out all these balancing tests for that and comes up very often in criminal cases when a defendant is deciding whether to testify, well, there may be prior conviction for that defendant, and the judge will decide whether or not those convictions can come in to impeach that defendant. Why has it been subject to intense criticism? There are a number of reasons. I think the primary concern by those who critique this rule is the unfair prejudice, which is, I think, obvious, has to be conceded by anyone talking about this, especially in the context of a criminal defendant who is testifying. When the jury hears about a prior conviction that they've had, the jury will make that propensity inference, which is improper, that if the defendant has committed this prior crime in the past, more likely to commit this crime they're not being charged with. Now, you get a limiting instruction, obviously, that precludes the jury from using it for that purpose, but that limiting instruction might not be effective in the jury. The other reason it's controversial is because the probative value of this evidence actually relies upon a propensity inference as well, which is that if someone has committed a crime in the past, they have a tendency to be dishonest, and therefore they are more likely to be dishonest on the stand today. Now, we do allow that propensity inference in Article 6 for Rule 608, which is prior dishonest actions, but it's something that is critiqued a lot that we can essentially, there's any probative value at all to someone having a propensity to be dishonest, and therefore we conclude they're less likely to be honest on the stand. The core of your new article is the set of empirical studies where you try to assess how Rule 609 actually operates in practice. Rather than thinking about it theoretically, you go out and try to figure out the attitudes of people in the field. Right. What made you decide to take this empirical approach to this problem? Well, I actually found that Rule 609 scholarship to be somewhat schizophrenic in some sense, and that there were minority people, certainly the legislators that passed Rule 609, thought that it was a very useful way of impeaching a criminal defendant. I also, I was a former prosecutor, I saw judges routinely admit these kind of prior convictions under the theory that it was useful to impeach the uh, defendant. But then when I would teach the class, I saw that my students, when I taught this rule, I saw my students hated this rule, thought it had no probative value and, and didn't know why these convictions were ever coming in. I started reading the scholarship and almost all the scholarship was against Rule 609, that is saying that these prior convictions should never come in. And so I saw a dissonance between 
what it, I mean, anecdotal evidence, what judges were doing, what legislators thought they were doing when they passed the rule, and sort of the reaction from my students and from the judges, at least from what I thought the judges were doing. And so I decided to try and find out what was actually going on when Rule 69 was applied. Was the actual probative value that the judges were seeing here? What was the actual unfair prejudice they were seeing? And in practice, how often did they actually admit these kind of prior convictions? Let's turn to your first study, which is where you surveyed students and judges about the probative value and unfair prejudice. Tell us how you set up that study and what you were trying to investigate specifically. I set out, I think, something like 21, 23 different crimes, assault, domestic violence, burglary, murder, rape, and so on. And I essentially asked the respondents to the study to estimate for each crime what is the probative value for impeachment. That is, how useful is it to a jury if they heard about this prior conviction in assessing that witness's credibility on a scale of zero to 100. Then I asked them to take that same prior conviction and assess the unfair prejudice to a jury if they heard about the conviction, how unfairly prejudicial would this be? And so I was asking the respondents to assign a numerical value to the probative value and to the unfair prejudice because essentially we're trying to do a balancing test here. I wanted to break that down and see what the probative value and for prejudice actually is. And the purpose was essentially, we have a balancing test in 609. The study told the respondents to assume this is a criminal defendant and that the charge that he was now on trial for was completely unrelated to the charge for the prior conviction. Under the 609 test, that would mean that you'd have to prove that the probative value outweighed the unfair prejudice to the jury about hearing about this. My thought was to see both for law students who were just exposed to this rule but had no experience using it in practice or seeing it in cases, what did they think the probative value was for all these prior convictions? What did they think the unfair prejudice was? And then compare that to what trial judges actually thought. I, I surveyed federal trial judges that have been applying this for years or decades, and to see if there's a difference between what the students thought and what the, I guess, the experts, the people who had been using this rule many, many, many years, what they thought the probative value and unfair prejudice was in these cases. And what did the survey find? Again, of these crimes, the survey found something not, not too surprising. There were some surprising specific facts about it. Uh, generally, it found that crimes of theft were thought to be much more probative of dishonesty or dishonest propensity than other kinds of crimes. There was actually a lot of consistency between what the students responded and what the judges responded in the sense of how the crimes were ranked. Crimes of violence, crimes of drug possession were ranked with a very low probative value and with a very high unfair prejudice. So neither group would admit those crimes very often, if at all. Whereas crimes of theft, these are crimes such as burglary, carjacking, embezzlement, grand theft auto, insider trading, even robbery and shoplifting, they had much higher scores for probative value, much lower scores for unfair prejudice, consistently between the students, the novices, and the judges who are the, the veterans, the experts. The difference I saw between students and judges was that judges were much more likely to admit all of these crimes, uh, with one exception, which is illegal immigration. But all the other crimes, the judges were much more likely to find a higher probative value and a lower unfair prejudice than the students were, with the result being that overall, the students would only admit two of these crimes on average, embezzlement, insider trading, whereas the judge would admit, I think, five or six or seven, depending on who measured it, all crimes of theft, but they'd admit more of them. So the ranking was the same, but judges were skewed much more towards admissibility than the students were. So it's the same curve, except that it's just shifted upward. Exactly, shifted upward, right. There are some really interesting implications of that. But before we examine those, let me turn to your other study on federal cases, just to round out the empirical picture here. Tell us about what you were trying to learn there and how you set that study up. This was more of a survey than a study. My RAs and I essentially went through all of the federal district court cases that we could find on Westlaw for the past 22 years that involved a Rule 609 motion with a criminal defendant. So we created a database of all of these cases, went through hundreds of cases, and looked at how often the judges were going to admit these crimes or didn't admit these crimes. We ended up with, I think, 31 separate crimes. Many of them we only saw once in the sample, but we had 10 crimes that were considered either four or more times. And so we looked at how often those crimes were admitted, how often they were admitted with a name of the crime being admitted, or sometimes they were sanitized, so the name of the crime was not admitted. And then we looked at the total percent of how often these crimes were admitted, how often crimes overall were admitted, and so on. And we're trying to find out in practice what are trial judges actually doing, as opposed to what they said they were doing when they answered the survey. And what did the case law study there find? So there we found mostly consistent with what we found with the survey. That is, crimes of theft were admitted far more often. The top of the list was possessing or receiving stolen property and grand larceny or theft. Those are admitted 80% of the time, roughly. Robbery and burglary also admitted a majority of the time, 65, 75% of the time. The one surprising outlier to me was drug possession and drug sale. 
they were by far the most common prior convictions. Drug possession was admitted 75% of the time, drug sale admitted 75% of the time. Often they were admitted without the name of the crime being told to the jury, but still it seemed odd because drug possession was ranked very low in our surveys, both with students and with judges. So within context, I guess, these drug possession crimes end up being admitted even though in theory they're not. Right. Okay, so in response to these really interesting findings, you propose in the paper that rather than abolishing Rule 609, which is really what a lot of the literature suggests, or at least the academic literature suggests, you argue that perhaps we should instead limit it to convictions for theft-type crimes. Why? Well, there's two steps there. One is why I don't think we should abolish it. Now, when we say abolish 609, what we're really talking about is essentially reforming 609 so that it precludes all of these prior convictions all the time. In other words, if we abolish 609, then these prior convictions would be decided under a standard 403 balancing test, and in fact, it would be worse for defendants. Judges would apply a 403 test and perhaps admit more of these. So the reformers, critics of 609, are really saying we should change 609 to say these prior convictions should never be admissible against a criminal defendant. And I thought that didn't make sense given the findings of the survey because, again, both the judges and the students in the survey found that some criminal convictions had a relatively high probative value, a probative value that outweighed the unfair prejudice, which means it's something the jurors should hear about. It's something they should take into consideration when they're reviewing the credibility of the defendant who's testifying. Now, having said that, many of these do not. And the sort of the purpose of the evidence rules is to sometimes take away discretion from the trial judges. We do that often with Rule 404 about character evidence. We do that in a lot of situations where we think that the trial judges are maybe perhaps not using the discretion properly. And given what I saw in my two surveys, judges overall as a whole, as well as the students, thought that only crimes of theft really had some probative value that would outweigh the unfair prejudice. And that there were some outlying judges, and some of them sometimes very often would admit crimes that clearly didn't fit in that category, the drug possession crimes. Even some outlying judges would admit assault crimes, firearm offenses that really have very little probative value according to my survey. And so the idea would be to amend 609 to give judges more guidance to tell them they can only admit these crimes if they're crimes of theft, and even then only if the probative value outweighs the unfair prejudice. If the uh, defendant is now on trial for a theft crime, the prior conviction is for theft, maybe the unfair prejudice is too high because the jury will have that unfair propensity of thinking this person has a tendency to steal things. But at least we'd have the judges have that discretion in those cases, but take it away from the judges, take that discretion away if we don't have a theft crime. I think your study introduces two interesting theoretical perspectives. One is that your entire methodology here was to ascertain how judges and maybe students were doing this balance in practice and then proposing a bright line rule, this is your amendment to Rule 609, using that data. And that reminds me of a bunch of other areas. So sentencing guidelines are one place where this... Right procedure occurred. It reminds me of a passage in the common law where Holmes suggests that the negligence standard produces lots of jury outcomes, and then ultimately we impose rules out of those jury outcomes. Mm -hmm. Is this basically your jurisprudential preference? Uh, would you like to see this happen in other areas as well, or is this confined just to this particular context? I guess it's confined to this particular context. I'm generally a big fan of judicial discretion, and I think that on a whole, I think judges, trial judges, and with my experience as a litigator, but also as in, in reading cases, I think judges tend to get it right. And it's a problem that, you, you know, the, the examples you give, like sentencing guidelines, so many of the critiques of that are you really can't have a one-size-fits-all model for most of these situations. The trial judge needs to take into consideration so many different factors that it's really hard to create standards that would be fair in most of those situations. Rule 609, I think, is an exception to that. There are some very specific fact patterns that keep repeating over and over again. You have a prior crime. We know what that crime is going to be. It's a crime of drug possession, a crime of drug sale, a crime of burglary. The elements of those crimes are essentially consistent across all cases. How jurors are going to see that is not going to change too much across all cases and so on. And also, given my survey, we can see that we have evidence, at least the judges are sometimes abusing the discretion, frankly, and admitting crimes that really don't have that kind of probative value, which I think is unfair. So I think given this case, this specific context where you have a repeated, very similar kinds of factors over and over again across the country, and you have evidence that judges are doing things that seem irrational or unfair, that's a time to create this kind of standard where judges have to be given more guidance, told essentially what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. But I wouldn't want to make that a general rule. I think generally trial judges use their discretion wisely and they have all the different factors and each case is so different. It'd be very hard to create a fair rule. Tell me a little bit more about 
those abusive practices. I think the question here is one really of distribution. I think what you're saying is that you agree with what the majority of judges decide with respect to these various crimes, but there are a couple of outliers that are doing weird things and you want to make them fall in line. Right. The average results that you have here in many ways suggest that we shouldn't have reform at all, that, well, judges pretty much do what we would expect them to do. It makes sense that you would preference theft crimes and find that those are more probative than, say, crimes of violence. So how significant is this group of outlier judges? So when we use the term outliers, I see outliers in two different ways. One is you have some judges who are outliers, where the majority of judges, substantial majority of judges, are, I think, doing a proper balance according to what the survey says, which is they're admitting crimes which really do have probative value for dishonesty, such as the theft crimes, and they are not admitting crimes that don't, whereas there are some judges who are admitting many, many more types of crimes, assault crimes, and so on. And my concern there is, and why I think it's important here to rein in those outliers, is because of the unfair prejudice of these prior crimes. I think it's very significant in a case where a criminal defendant is on trial for a crime and the jury is going to hear about a, a prior conviction. That's something that's, that's a very dangerous thing for a jury to hear about. So I think those outliers can do real damage. Now, the other type of outlier is a specific kind of crime, which is specifically drug crimes, drug possession, drug sale. The vast majority of judges are bringing those in as crimes of dishonesty, even though when they answer the survey and when our students have the survey, those kind of cases get very low marks for probative value and relatively high marks for unfair prejudice. And those are cases that happen a lot. The number of cases we looked at, I think there were over 100, over half the cases we looked at had drug possession or drug sale being considered. This is uh, something across the country that's happening quite often. Drug sale cases, drug possession cases are often coming in in cases where the defendant is on trial for a drug charge. I think it's unfair given the results of the survey that we had. And so I do think it's important in those cases to not allow that discretion to happen. The prejudice is too great and the practice in that case for the drug cases is too widespread. In many ways, it's about tying to the mass that the judges think theoretically that it shouldn't come in, so maybe it shouldn't come in and there should be no discretion. Final question for you. What's next on this project? What work remains to be done in this area, either by you or by others? Well, I would certainly like to see, one is we could see on the state level how this might differ. I mentioned in the paper that I think it's 22 states that actually already do this. They already make a special category for crimes of theft. We could review how that actually works. Another possibility is to review a survey of jurors. What we're trying to do and what judges are always trying to do is essentially second guess how unfairly this will prejudice a juror. That might be a more significant resource allocation to try and do with jurors. The other issue is I'd be interested in perhaps expanding this to other areas of discretion where judges exercise the discretion. I mentioned in the paper that a balancing test between probative value and unfair prejudice is a pretty common thing in trial. Obviously, Rule 403 comes up all the time where judges have to decide whether or not the unfair prejudice substantially outweighs probative value. And it'd be interesting to see if that's consistent across different jurisdictions and whether or not judges are, are using that Rule 403 properly. I think you'd have to find a situation like 609 where you had a specific repeated kind of fact that was coming in, perhaps explicit photographs of some kind of a crime of violence or some case where some kind of fact where we can look at across jurisdictions, look at hundreds of cases and see if judges are responding to this the same way. So I'd be interested in looking at other ways that judges are actually applying Rule 403 in this balancing test and see if there are other ways in which we think they are being inconsistent in, in the way they're applying it. Well, Rick, thanks a lot for taking the time to talk about your new studies on Rule 609. Great having you on the show. It was great being here. Thanks for the opportunity. As I mentioned in the interview, few, if any, topics have appeared more on excited utterance over the last year and a half than Rule 609. And in many ways, why shouldn't it? Rule 609 is a frequently used rule that pits some significant ideological positions. Its origins in witness competency rules reflects a judgment that prior convicts shouldn't be trusted at their word. But at the same time, because of concerns about unfair prejudice, Rule 609 effectively chills defendant testimony, which means a loss of evidence at trial and a risk of wrongful convictions. Rick injects an important new perspective into this otherwise acrimonious debate. Just what do judges think about prior convictions, both in principle and in practice? At least as a whole, it seems that they make some sensible decisions about which crimes are useful and which are not. In fact, students seem to make similarly sensible decisions, which may suggest that prospective jurors will, will do the same, although law students aren't necessarily representative of the usual juror pool. But if this is true, 
if judges and possibly jurors make sensible trade-offs, then do we need to worry about Rule 609 as it stands at all? Rick suggests yes, that in this context, a bright-line rule would curb outlier judges and prevent questionable decisions such as admitting drug convictions. And while I'm sympathetic to the uniformity concerns, I remain a bit more skeptical. Evidence is a discretionary field because so much of it is fact-specific. If judges are generally reaching sensible conclusions, I'd prefer to leave things alone. Regardless of what you think the policy outcome should be, though, I think Rick's study sheds some important light on tactical trial decisions for defendants. It shows that judges, and maybe even jurors, do thoughtfully weigh probative value and unfair prejudice in this context. Combined with Jeff Bellin's study on the silence penalty that we discussed earlier this season, Rick's results may suggest that having a defendant testify may not be as bad as conventionally thought. And with that, we come to the end of the third season of Excited Utterance. I hope you've enjoyed the episodes as much as we've enjoyed putting them together. As always, I want to thank Alex Nunn and Margot Wilkinson-Smith, my associate producers, who worked tirelessly with me to sift through the evidence literature in search of great podcasting material. Carson Smith, who has done an amazing job doing audio processing episode after episode. And Aaron Parr Carranza, who has managed all the logistics behind the scenes. Thanks also to the Bramstetter Program at Vanderbilt Law School for its continued support and the Vanderbilt Institute for Digital Learning for an initial equipment grant. Finally, I want to give a shout out to the Institute for Civil Justice at RAND in Santa Monica for hosting my sabbatical this semester and giving me a place to continue podcasting. I'm Ed Chang, wishing all of you a happy and healthy holiday season, and I hope you'll join me on January 8th with the start of the new spring semester when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof. Thank you.